Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to be going over the concept of WAC or the weighted average cost of capital, otherwise known as the discount rate in this lesson, cover how to calculate it quickly, what to do about leases, and then go through some common interview questions about this topic. We previously published a DCF overview tutorial, which I'm linking to in the card here, but we didn't have time to go into depth on some of the topics like the discount rate. And while it is important to understand the calculations, I think that concepts relating to the discount rate and WAC are actually more important for interview purposes. I'm going to tell you upfront that I do have a bit of a bias here because a lot of textbooks and academic sources put a lot of time and effort into calculating WAC and the cost of equity for use in a DCF analysis. And in my opinion, it's not really a great use of time. It is much better to spend your time understanding the company's business model and what the company's revenue growth and margins might look like as opposed to trying to go through 200 rows of calculations in Excel to get WAC exactly correct. It's much better to be roughly correct than precisely wrong with this one. If you want this entire tutorial in writing, as well as the Excel file and the additional materials, go to mergersandinquisitions.com slash WAC dash formula. So just WAC dash formula and you'll get everything there. This is going to be a longer lesson once again, because this is a very conceptual topic. So I'm going to divide it up into parts and then give you the timestamps for everything so you can jump around as required. First, we'll start with the big idea behind the discount rate. Then I will show you the quick and dirty method of calculating WAC using free publicly available sources. Then we'll go into some more complex calculations and how you can do something a little bit more complicated than just pulling free information off the internet for this. Then we'll discuss leases in the WAC calculation and what to do about the fact that operating leases are now shown on company's balance sheets. And then in the last part, we'll go through a few common interview questions about how different items affect WAC and what happens when the taxes change or the debt levels change or when you're in an emerging market versus a developed market, for example. Let's get started with part one, the big idea behind the discount rate. In evaluation, you always value companies by projecting their cash flows five, 10, or more years into the future. But if you get $1,000 in 10 years, that is worth less than $1,000 today because we could take that $1,000 today and turn it into more by year 10. So to estimate what $1,000 after 10 years is worth today, we need to use the discount rate to calculate its present value. Now, the two main options for the discount rate in a DCF are the cost of equity, which pairs with levered free cash flow, and then WAC, the weighted average cost of capital, which pairs with unlevered free cash flow. With cost of equity, you are looking at the discount rate for just the company's common shares. So you're looking at potential returns from the company's stock price going up and also from the company issuing dividends. With the cost of debt, you're looking at the discount rate for just the company's debt, which means returns from the interest paid on the debt and also the market value of the debt changing. Cost of preferred stock is very similar, but preferred dividends are not tax deductible. Coupon rates tend to be higher. And so preferred stock tends to be more expensive than debt. So if you think about all these components, the formula for WAC is actually very simple. You just take the cost of equity, multiply by the percent equity the company has, take the cost of debt, multiply by one minus the tax rate, and then multiply by the percent debt because the interest on debt is tax deductible. And then you take the cost of preferred stock and multiply by the percent preferred stock. And this is the very simple formula for WAC. Of course, what makes it difficult is not the formula, but how to get all the proper values for all these terms in the formula. The idea really is that you invest proportionally in the company's entire capital structure and WAC represents your expected long-term annualized return. So maybe the company uses 80% equity and 20% debt and it has a 25% tax rate. If you invest $1,000, that means you put 800 in its equity and 200 in its debt. Now, similar company stock prices have increased by 8% per year on average, and then an additional 2% of the returns have come from dividends. The effective yield on debt is 6% and similar companies are also yielding about 6%. And so WAC in this case is just 10%, the cost of equity times the equity percentage. And then you take the debt percentage, the 20% right here, and then you multiply by the 6% cost of debt, multiply by one minus the tax rate, and that gets you to around 8.9%. So in theory, you'll earn about $89 per year on a $1,000 investment, and that's the idea with WAC. Of course, you don't earn that in cash, that's over the very long term, and a lot of it reflects capital gains from the company's stock price going up. If you want to translate this into real life and make a very quick and dirty calculation, you can do it. You don't need to do anything fancy or complicated. In fact, you can do it in about three to five minutes worth of work. 
you need to find the company's cost of equity, cost of debt, cost of preferred stock, and the percentages that these represent in its capital structure. So for the percentages, it's easy. You can go into the company's filings and find the debt and preferred stock and then look up its market cap or equity value online. So in these examples, I'm going to be using Steel Dynamics. It's a company we've been using in one of the case studies on this site. And if you go to the company's balance sheet, you can pretty easily find its current debt. So I'm just pulling up their balance sheet here. I'm using the annual one, but you could use the interim one. It doesn't really matter. I'm just using this to keep it simple and to pull everything from one source. Let's go over to our quick and dirty calculation over here. I've already entered the equity value. I just looked up the company's market cap on the specific valuation date that we're using here, which is July 31st, 2021. Let's enter the debt. So we have 86.894. And then we have 3015.782. Company has no preferred stock, so we don't need to worry about that. And you can confirm this by just looking at their balance sheet and going down, and you can see that under equity, they do have non controlling interest, but they don't have anything for preferred stock here. So we have some of this already. We have our percentages. Let's take these and divide by the total right here. And so it's about 81% equity and about 18 or 19% debt. Now, for the cost of debt and the cost of preferred, the easiest method here is to take the interest expense on the income statement and divide by the average debt balance for a quick approximation. You can do something similar for preferred stock, except you use preferred dividends and use the preferred stock balance instead. Let's go here and do this. And I'll enter zero for the cost of preferred stock because the company doesn't have any. For the cost of debt, let's go to the income statement and get the interest expense right here. So 94.877. And then we need to get the average debt balance. Now we have the debt balance for part of this period. So let's take this and then let's do an average here. And then we need to get it from the prior year because we want the debt balance over this entire period. The reason is that in case the debt balance changed, the interest expense also changed as a result. And so we want to reflect that. So here we have in the prior period, 89.356 and then 2644.988. So let's enter both of those. So we have 3.25% for the cost of debt. Let's keep going here. The cost of equity is a little bit trickier because it's hard to say what a company's stock should return over a certain period. The usual approach is to take the risk-free rate and then you add the equity risk premium and you multiply by levered beta. The rationale here is that you want to take what you could earn in risk-free government bonds, such as U.S. Treasuries, 10-year U.S. Treasuries, and then you add the additional return offered by the stock market, and then you multiply by a factor representing this company's volatility or risk relative to the market as a whole. So all this is well and good, but how do you actually find all these numbers without doing a whole lot of work or extra calculations on your own? The risk-free rate is easy because you can just Google 10-year U.S. Treasury yields, or if you're in a different country, look up the name of the 10-year government bond in your country, and you should be able to find a listing of yields pretty easily. So here, I've pulled up the numbers for the U.S. If we go to around our valuation date, scroll too far there, we can see that right around the day, a day or two after, the 10-year yield was 1.2%. So let's go in and just enter that for the risk-free rate. And then for the equity risk premium, we could get it from a couple different sources. Statista frequently has estimates and you can easily Google it. The big four firms and even firms like Duff and Phelps often include estimates. So they're saying 5.5%. Statista also seems to be saying around 5.5 or 5.6%. So we're going to go with those. There's no point even trying to calculate this yourself. And then for the levered beta, you can actually find this pretty easily for a US-based public company like this, you can just go to a site like Yahoo Finance and they give you the five-year monthly beta that they've calculated. So this means the company on average is about 50% riskier than the stock market as a whole. So it's 1.45 right here. Let's go in and enter that. And then the cost of equity is just the risk-free rate plus the equity risk premium times levered beta. And so we get to around 9.18% for that. 
and I have some suggestions for other sources here for the equity risk premium and levered beta. And so now we can get to WAC and really it just took a few minutes of work. To calculate WAC, we take our cost of equity and multiply by the percent equity. And then we take our cost of debt, we multiply by the percent debt, and then we multiply by one minus the company's tax rate. This is a named cell here. So it's up here. I've gone and calculated the historical average tax rate. So we're taking it right from there. And then we take our cost of preferred stock and we multiply by the percent preferred stock. And so we get to a whack of just below 8%. And that's how you can do it very quickly and simply using all free sources without killing yourself or spending too much time on it. Now, ideally you want a range of values for WAC, especially in a more complex analysis. And that leads us into the second part of this tutorial or really part three of this lesson. We're going to talk about some more complex co calculations for WAC and what you might do a bit differently if you want to be more precise with these numbers. Let's start with the cost of debt and the cost of preferred stock. These technically represent the cost if the company issued additional debt or preferred stock. And so it's more accurate to use the yield or the yield to maturity, otherwise known as the YTM on these issuances. For example, if a company issues 5% coupon rate bonds for a thousand, but then their market value falls to 950, you could buy them at 950 and you're going to end up earning more than 5% per year because you bought them at 950, but you're going to get back a thousand when the company finally repays these bonds and vice versa. If they trade at a premium, if they go up to 1050, then you will earn less than 5% per year because you're paying a premium, but you're only getting back that thousand at the end. So it's useful to search for fair value or fair market value of the debt in the company's annual or interim filings. I'm going to scroll back here to where Steel Dynamics discloses their fair value. And they give the average coupon rate on all these tranches. And then they have variable rate debt as well, but it's very small. So we're mostly going to pay attention to the fair value of the fixed rate debt right here. Once we have this, we can then use the yield function in Excel to get a slightly more accurate number. Let's see what that looks like. So I'll go over here and for the pre-tax cost of debt, I will enter yield. And then for the settlement date, we'll just use the valuation date. For the maturity, this is a good question. We don't know exactly what it is, but if you scroll around in the filings, I'm just clicking through my highlights, they do disclose the maturity dates of their different tranches. And if you look at the rough math here, it's about 10 years, maybe nine years into the future. So we can use December 31st, 2030 for the average maturity date right here. So I'll go into Excel and enter that. So 12, 31, 2020. For the rate, they disclose 3.2% in the filings. So we'll take that 3.2% from right there. And then for this next term, the PR, this essentially represents the market value of the debt relative to its face value. But we have to multiply by 100 because of a quirk in how Excel accepts this as input. So in the filings, we have the fair value and the face value of the debt right here. So let's go in and enter both of these 3329.2. 914 and then divide by 3075.96 multiply by 100 for the redemption value we'll say 100 and assume that the company will repay all 100% of this debt and for the frequency we can just say 2 for semi annual and i got an error here because i messed up and entered 2020 instead of 2030 now we get to 2.22% so it's a little bit lower than our estimate but 2.2% versus 3. 2% or 3.25% barely makes a difference. So it's not absolutely crucial to complete this step of the process. Let's keep going now. With cost of equity, you can't really make the risk-free rate or the equity risk premium components more complicated. They're certainly not worth calculating or even trying to calculate yourself. But instead of using the company's own levered beta, you can calculate it based on the comparable public companies instead. The argument here is that the peer companies better represent risk and potential returns. Just like when you use multiples for valuation purposes, looking at multiples of similar companies might better represent what your company should be worth. Looking at the comparable companies here might better represent the risk and potential returns of your company, assuming of course they are actually comparable. They're in the same industry and they're about the same size. So you have to screen for comparable companies, get information on all the capital structures, their levered betas, their tax rates, and then you have to unlever beta first to separate the inherent business risk from the risk of leverage. Now, this process is where it gets time consuming because you have to find these companies, you have to look up the information in their filings. I've already done all that off screen and this is why this calculation can take quite a bit of time if you do it this way. 
you're gonna need some way to screen these companies, to look up the information in the filings, and services like Capital IQ and FactSec can help, but if you don't have access, you're going to have to do a lot of this manually. And then as the next step, we can take the beta for each company and then unlever it to separate the inherent business risk from the risk of leverage. And to do that, we can use this formula, unlevered beta equals levered beta divided by one plus the debt to equity ratio times one minus the tax rate plus the preferred to equity ratio. The logic is that we always want unlevered beta to be less than or equal to levered beta. And so this one plus term ensures that we're dividing, we're dividing by one plus something. And so this ensures that unlevered beta is always less than or equal to levered beta. The risk from the company's business alone is less than the risk from the business plus the risk from the company's debt. So we're going to estimate this and then remove the risk from leverage by using these ratios, the debt to equity ratio and the preferred equity ratio. We will reduce the debt to equity ratio one by a little bit by one minus the tax rate because of the tax deduction for interest. Let's go into Excel and see what this looks like. So let's start by taking the levered beta right here and then we will divide by one plus the debt to equity ratio. We'll multiply this by one minus the tax rate for just this company and then we'll add the preferred to equity ratio. We have that, and then we'll copy this down, and our median here, I can enter this again, for some reason that was already filled in, but the median comes out to 1.27, and now we can feed this into the next part of the analysis, which is relevering beta. So we have this median unlevered beta, and now we're gonna relever it based on the capital structure of our company, Steel Dynamics, the current or planned structure. The idea here is that we're taking the inherent business risk, we're saying that the peer companies more accurately reflect that risk, and now we're going to adjust it upward because of the fact that our company, Still Dynamics, does have debt and it may have preferred stock, and those are going to increase the overall risk associated with the business. And to do this, we can just flip around this formula. We can take unlevered beta, and now we can multiply by one plus the debt to equity ratio times one minus the tax rate, and then add the preferred stock to equity ratio. We'll start with the, current, the company's current capital structure right here. And so I will take the unlevered beta and then I will multiply by one plus the debt to equity ratio times one minus the tax rate. And then I'll take the preferred to equity ratio right here. And so we have levered beta. Now, something else we can also do is calculate it slightly differently by using the optimal capital structure. The idea here is that we take the median equity percentage and debt percentage from the public comps and also the preferred percentage if more than one company actually had it. And then we say that our company, if we take its total capital and multiply by these percentages, should have slightly different amounts of debt and equity in its capital structure and also preferred stock. And to do this one, we can just take our formula here for relevered beta and copy it down to this one. And now we can see the numbers are slightly different. If we assume the company's debt percentage is somewhat higher than its levered beta, as you'd expect, is also somewhat higher because there's more risk from debt now. So we have levered beta calculated a few different ways. We also have the company's historical levered beta here. And so we have different estimates of the company's risk relative to the market risk. We can now calculate cost of equity and WAC in a few different ways. First off, we can just take the company's beta and its capital structure and go with that. So just its historical numbers, very similar to the quick and dirty method that we used before. So if we go with cost of equity based on historical beta, it's the risk-free rate plus the equity risk premium, and then we just multiply it by the company's historical beta right there, and that's one way that we could do it. Now, another option is that we could take the comparables beta and the company's current capital structure and calculate it based on that. So we don't assume any changes to their capital structure, we just assume it stays as is based on its current balance sheet. And with this one, we can go and get our risk-free rate. We'll take our equity risk premium, and then we'll multiply by levered beta based on the current capital structure right here in this top row. So we have that. And then this last one, we take beta and the capital structure from the comparable companies. So with method number one, we're basically just looking at the company by itself. And with method number three, we are mostly relying on the peer companies. And then method number two is somewhere in the middle between these two extremes. And these are a few different ways to calculate or estimate the cost of equity. With this one, once again, let's take our risk-free rate and then add our equity risk premium and then multiply by the levered beta from the optimal capital structure. In other words, what it looks like based on the comparable public companies here. And so we have that.
Once we have all this, we can then do the same thing for WAC itself. So if we base this on the company's current capital structure, for example, then we take the cost of equity from right here, we multiply by the percent equity in the capital structure, then we go up and take the cost of debt from right here, and then we multiply by the percent debt in the capital structure, we'll multiply by one minus the company's tax rate as well. And then we'll take the cost of preferred stock and multiply by the percent preferred stock. And so that's WAC based on the company's current capital structure. If we use the optimal capital structure instead, we go to the cost of equity from right here, we'll multiply by the percent equity, and then we get the cost of debt from right up here, we multiply by the percent debt in the capital structure, and then we multiply by one minus the tax rate for this version, and then we get the cost of preferred stock and multiply by the percent preferred stock right there. And then for the last one here, WAC based on the current capital structure and the historical cost of equity. So here we take our cost of equity from based on the historical beta rather, we multiply by the company's current equity percentage. Then we get the cost of debt and we multiply by the percent debt right here and then multiply by one minus the tax rate. Then we take the cost of preferred stock and multiply by the preferred stock percentage. And now we have these different numbers for WAC. To get an idea of the overall range here, we can take the average. You can see that WAC comes out to just below 8%. So for all that additional work, it's not really all that different from the quick and dirty result we got over here, which was also a WAC number of just under 8%. And this is one of the many reasons it's rarely useful to go through all the trouble of doing all this extra work. Yes, banks do it in pitch books and official valuations and so on, but if you're just trying to get a quick estimate of something to use in a DCF, you don't really need to do all this. The results are rarely gonna be that much different from the quick and dirty method. The whole point of this is that we wanna establish a range of values for WAC, and these different methods give us a decent range. So something like an 8.157% versus 8.123% difference is irrelevant. We wanna know if WAC should be between 10 and 12%, or between 13 and 15%, or between six and 8%, for example. As a general rule of thumb, you wanna aim for a range with a difference of maybe two to 3% between the min and the max. So something like 10 to 12% or 10 to 13%, at least if you're working with a large public company here. Now in this case, looking at steel dynamics, you might wonder what the proper range is, and we would probably say at least seven to 8%, but you could expand that a little bit and we'd say maybe six to 9% or maybe even seven to 10% or 6.5% to 8.5%. Any of those ranges here would be valid based on the work that we've done so far. And this is the whole point of calculating WAC using a couple of different methods to see what the range might look like. That's it for our more complex calculations. Let's now go into part four and examine leases in WAC. Now there are two basic lease types, finance leases and operating leases, and we have a whole video describing the differences in the accounting. So take a look at that. I'll link to it in the cards in this video. Finance leases tend to be very small. Companies often group them together with debt without a separate disclosure. So the reality is that most WAC analyses have always counted finance leases as a part of the debt balance, but since they're so small, their impact has been very small. So with many of these companies, for example, the debt number here actually includes some small amount of finance leases, but it's so tiny relative to the whole debt balance that it's not really going to impact the unlevered beta or these capital structure percentages or other numbers here. Operating leases though tend to be much bigger and before 2019, no one really thought about treating them differently in the WAC calculations because they were off balance sheet and so they weren't really considered a part of the company's capital structure. But then in 2019, operating leases moved on to company's balance sheets. The result is that a lot of obsessive compulsive people are now freaking out about what to do with operating leases in enterprise value, WAC, multiples, etc. And again, we've covered this before in a couple different tutorials, so I'll refer you to that. I'm just going to deal with the impact on WAC here. Our recommendation is to ignore them in the WAC calculation and de deduct the full lease expense in unlevered free cash flow. Do not count leases as capital for purposes of the TCF. The reason for this is that both finance and operating leases are really operational decisions despite the labels. And the goal in a DCF is to capture the cash inflows and cash outflows. It doesn't matter how a company classifies a lease because ultimately they are still paying a cash rental expense each year. And that is a cash outflow. It reduces how much they can reinvest into the business and how much they can spend on other things. So 
the fact that one lease has a different classification on the balance sheet than another, or the fact that one is split into interest and depreciation and the other is not, doesn't matter from a cash flow perspective, and that's why we recommend treating these as simple operating expenses. Under US GAAP, this is easy because operating expenses should already deduct the rental expense. You may have to make a small adjustment for finance leases, but that's about it. Under IFRS, you have to deduct the interest element for both types of leases in unlevered free cash flow because if you don't, if you start with just operating income, that's not going to have this deduction for the interest element of the leases. Now, another option here is that you could count operating leases as capital in the WAC formula. And if you go to the Excel spreadsheet here, if you go to lease underscore WAC, I have a version here that does just that. So we have separate terms for leases. We factor it into unlevered beta, into relevered beta, and you can see what the differences in this version of the analysis look like. At a basic level, you have to add another term in the unlevered and relevered beta formulas and also in the WAC formula. And so I have on screen these formulas. They're basically the same as the previous ones, except now we have this term for leases divided by equity times one minus the tax rate. And we have a cost of lease term times one minus the tax rate times the percent leases in WAC. We multiply by one minus the tax rate because the full lease expense is tax deductible under both major accounting systems. Despite the fact that it's presented differently, leases of all types reduce the company's pre-tax income. And so if you go over to our analysis here, you can see what this looks like. In unlevered beta, for example, we now have this additional term, column G, total leases. We're taking total leases, dividing by the equity value for the company and multiplying by one minus the tax rate. So we have this additional term. Unlevered beta comes out to be a slightly lower number versus the previous version. And then when we relever beta, we have to include this same term, the total leases divided by the equity value times one minus the tax rate. So we have some differences here. Overall though, it makes a pretty modest impact. WAC using this method comes out to about 7.69% versus the traditional method, it comes out to about 7.85%. In a detailed DCF analysis, a difference of 0.16% in WAC is not significant. It doesn't really change the range of appropriate values. And so it's a whole lot of extra work for relatively little. In general, WAC will tend to decrease when the company has low or reasonable leverage because the cost of leases is usually less than or equal to the cost of debt. So you're effectively adding another low cost source of funding to the company's capital structure. And that's why WAC tends to go down. Counting operating leases as capital though creates a lot of extra work because you have to find all this information and it barely affects the DCF output it also gets very complicated in unlevered free cash flow because now you have to add back the full lease expense. You have to use EBITDA instead of EBITDA for US companies. You have to change around the enterprise value calculation. And it's really much ado about nothing. It's a lot of extra time and effort for almost no change in the analysis. So we think it's easiest to leave the operating leases out of the WAC formula and just calculate it in the conventional way. Let's go to the last major topic now and talk about how WAC changes when various items in the capital structure or the company's financial profile change. So the short answer here is that you should take a look at the summary. There's a DCF underscore changes tab right here, and it does a pretty good job of summing up everything that might happen as you deal with a smaller company or a bigger company, or as you go from no debt to some debt or some debt to no debt, what happens when you count operating leases as debt, we go through the most common changes right here. But I think the easiest way to think about this intuitively is to think about the risk and potential returns from changes to different components of WAC. For example, smaller companies and ones in emerging markets tend to be riskier, as you'd expect, but they also offer higher potential returns. Intuitively, you'd expect that, say, a startup company with high growth potential does have much higher potential returns than a big established Fortune 100 company, but the risk is also much higher. It might go out of business quite easily. And so as a result, if you look at a smaller company, cost of equity is gonna be higher, cost of debt is gonna be higher because it costs more to borrow. The WAC is probably gonna be higher, assuming the same capital structure percentages because everything about the company is riskier, but the potential returns are also higher. And it's going to be generally worth less in an unlevered DCF analysis because of this much higher or at least significantly higher WAC. If you look at a higher risk-free rate, a higher equity risk premium, and a higher beta, these are all components of the cost of equity and they all increase the cost of equity. Now, cost of equity is a component of WAC and so WAC has to increase as well. 
So if any of these go up, you are generally gonna see higher values for WAC and lower values out of the unlevered DCF analysis. And that explains this segment of the chart here. When these go up, WAC goes up and the company's implied value goes down. When these go down, WAC goes down and the company's implied value goes up because these are direct measures of risk and potential returns. Now, there are some trickier topics here. For example, when debt increases, it depends on how much debt the company already has. Because when you go from no debt to some debt, often you will see an initial decrease in WAC because debt is cheaper than equity and the cheaper cost outweighs its drawbacks. But once you go above a certain debt to total capital ratio, the drawbacks of debt, namely the added bankruptcy risk, start to outweigh its cost benefits. And so WAC increases as a result. And so debt to total capital and WAC follows a bit of a U-shaped curve. And again, we've done other tutorials and shown other examples for this one. A higher tax rate is also interesting. As you can see here, it tends to reduce the cost of equity and the cost of debt and WAC, but oftentimes the company's implied value goes down because a higher tax rate reduces their unlevered free cash flows and the terminal value. Now, it also reduces the discount rate because if a company actually has debt, a higher tax rate means that debt has more of a cost advantage. A bigger cost advantage for debt means that it's less risky for both the lenders and also for the equity investors. And so WAC tends to go down, but the fact that unlevered free cash flow also goes down and the terminal value also goes down means that in general, when the tax rate goes up, you're gonna get a lower value from an unlevered discounted cash flow analysis. So those are a few of the common questions you might expect. We're at the end, so let's do a recap and summary. The big idea behind the discount rate is that WAC, the weighted average cost of capital, represents the long-term annualized returns that you might get if you invest proportionally in the company's capital structure and hold your investment for a very long time. The quick and dirty way of calculating it, we demonstrated in Excel, Essentially, all you have to do is look up some information on the company's balance sheet, look up the risk-free rate, the equity risk premium, levered beta. You can get all these on free sources. You can calculate the cost of debt and preferred stock from the company's filings, and you can get the cost of equity and WAC using the traditional formula. And it takes maybe three, four, five minutes, and it's quite simple to do if you already have the company's filings. If you wanna make it more complicated, you can go through this process of unlevering beta and relevering beta as we did here to get cost of equity with a few different methods and then calculate WAC with a few different methods. You can also use the yield function to calculate the cost of debt rather than just using a simple interest expense divided by the average debt balance. With leases in WAC, we recommend not counting them as capital, but if you want to, you can. You just have to add extra terms for the least equity ratio and multiply by one minus the tax rate. And then finally, for these questions about how certain changes affect WAC, for the most part, they're pretty straightforward. You just have to think about how different components change. And if something pushes up one component, like the cost of debt or cost of equity, and nothing else changes, then WAC is going to increase. If the opposite happens, if something pushes down one of those, then WAC is going to decrease, assuming that nothing else changes. Now, there are a few trickier scenarios, which we laid out in the chart here, like the one with taxes and the ones with changes in debt. Those depend a bit on the company's current debt to total capital ratio, but for the most part, it's not too complicated if you understand how everything is linked together and how different components changing affect the cost of equity and the cost of debt and the percentages in the company's capital structure. That's it for this tutorial. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about how to calculate WAC using simple methods, complex methods, and what to do because of some recent accounting changes around leases and lease accounting.